four years working for Hyundai and Kia's uh, Global Leadership Development Center in South Korea, just outside of Seoul. That was a really exciting job because we, we brought people from all over the world to our training center. Did a lot of face-to-face -face development. At the same time, so that was in 2012, I started working there. At the same time, I started my doctoral program at Boise State Online, and I also started teaching for them in 2012 as well. So it was a really big time of transition for me and my family, moving and so on. Uh, but at that time, I did a lot of face-to-face -face development, but after I came to Boise, uh, I started doing uh, instructional design uh, as a consultant. That's what I've been doing for the last three years, uh, three and a half actually, and also teaching online for uh, academic advising course, it's an introduction to online learning. It's a great course, I love it. I designed it, I teach it. It's like the only course I get to design and teach. And uh, it's been fantastic. The first time I taught that about two years ago was before I finished my dissertation. And you know, I had kind of common course evaluation result, right? It was about 4.5 or something, first time teaching, right? Never as good as you want. Uh, and then, you know, prior to that, my course evaluations would always fluctuate a lot. Like sometimes we had 4.2. Sometimes I'd be like 4.8, I didn't know what I did right or wrong that time, it felt random. Sometimes I'd be at 4.3, you know, I'd blame it on some student or something, right? Oh, I was a bad student that was dragging me down or something. Uh, but after my immediacy study, for the last uh, year and a half now, that ACAD advising course has consistently had an evaluation of 4.9 every semester. I got it back yesterday for this last seven week session, and it was a 4.8, I'm like, oh, what did I do wrong? You know, because <laughs> it went down point one. so I was pretty surprised, but, um, that course, I also teach a course for, uh, I teach courses for ed tech also, I'm currently teaching an online course design course for them as well, at the graduate level. So, uh, what I really enjoy is being able to put my research into practice, and so, I hope that I can explain some of those implications of my research, and how you can improve your instructor uh, immediacy in your courses, but first, you probably need to understand what the term immediacy means. I don't know, have, how many of you have heard the word immediacy before? Uh, okay, all right. How many of you have heard of social presence before? Yeah, a few more hands going up there. Um, so my first slide asks, you know, are you familiar with these concepts? And the concept of social presence has been much more popular in the online environment uh, since the early 2000s. But the concept of immediacy has been much more researched over the last 40 years or so. It had an extremely impactful uh, research agenda in uh, portion-based, especially lecture hall-based training for many, many years. There's been hundreds and hundreds of articles that uh, studied, uh, published on that. So I want to explain the immediacy construct first. Uh, so it's basically behaviors that reduce the physical and or psychological distance between people, the kind of definition of it. You know, what does that mean? A lot of this, they start off with nonverbal behaviors, things like eye contact, you know, the way I standing behind the podium versus being out and about among the students. And again, it was all mostly lecture hall focused, so uh, things like smiling, using people's names, asking them to introduce themselves. Last year when I presented this in Boise, I asked everyone to introduce themselves, but we had five people. So this year I didn't bother because I don't want to pick up, I, I ran out of time at the end though, so I didn't want to run out of time today. Uh, but normally I would ask you know, my students their names the very first day, even if I have a large class of 40 or 50 students. So um, anyway, yeah, so it's basically these verbal and nonverbal cues. Uh, originally, the research started out with nonverbal cues, and later on, it moved much more into verbal cues as well. And there's been some debate within the field whether or not, not verbal is really immediate or not, but I believe that there is based on my research. So, uh, verbal would be things like the words you choose, right? So, for example, if you say, um, uh, you and I will versus we will, right? We will implies that we're close and that we're together, we're part of the same group, whereas you and I. It's separating us and putting some distance between us. So syntax is of where there's been a lot of research, but also just the way you uh, invite people with words. And the idea of immediacy is that, well, I'm gonna get, I'll start with my slides, uh, really is about the idea of like versus dislike, arousal versus non-arousal, and pleasure and displeasure domains. So uh, with all of these, you know, arousal, and, you know, if, you, if I arouse you in some way, if I use your name, people are aroused by their name, right? We all love our name. Now you say, you hear your name, and you're, immediately you're piqued, right? You're interested. Why are they talking about me? So people are aroused by anything that's kind of focused on themselves, right? That's why we all like things like Myers Briggs and Strengths Finder. It's so interesting, right? Because it's about us. So anything that arouses you, and that you also find to be uh, pleasing, would also be uh, leading you to have a sense of light. And so based on that, these three areas also of arousal and pleasure, and also 
uh, a lot of the research on meridian, particularly talks about power, right? Being, if you're, if, if you feel powerful, I mean, you're more likely to feel safe to approach someone. Uh, but if you're feeling submissive, you're like, more likely to retract or pull away from them. So it's really about the idea of uh, how these things impact your feelings of like and dislike and ultimately approaching someone or staying away from them. You know, we're all looking at different cues, whether or not we are, feel that we are welcome to approach someone or not welcome to approach them. By the words we use, by the body language. Think about maybe back in the days when you would go to a bar, right, or something, or some kind of social event that you looking for all these signals, is someone interested in me, or am I interested in them, or they look, you know, so all these different visual and verbal cues that we use. Uh, a lot of it goes back to, you know, pro the idea of proxemics, and so it's cultural, definitely there's some cultural differences. I live in South Korea, I know that Koreans have a much more physical space, right? So men don't typically walk close to a woman next to them because they don't want to imply anything, right? Um, so the social space might be different, uh, but at the same time, the research has found that the construct of immediacy holds up across cultures and across genders and so on. Um, so the history does go back uh, to about the 1960s when Moravians started publishing on this. Uh, and there's, there was extensive research in the 80s and 90s on it in the classroom. And then very little in online. And that was the impetus for my uh, research because there was so little of this done online. So immediacy has been found to have many benefits in the classroom research, right? Uh, intent to persist, learn of satisfaction, as I mentioned, across different ethnic groups and cultures, across gender, uh, across disciplines, uh, compliance with instructor requests. Students are just more, you know, hey, well, let's get together and talk, or, you know, please ask questions, and students can listen more, right, or uh, respond to that. Um, inc improved attendance and participation, decreased anxiety, which I think is a really important one, especially in online, uh, improved perceptions of instructors as caring, confident, trustworthy, incredible. Right? Are these all kinds of things that you want your students to feel about you as an instructor? Right? Typically you do. Uh, so the nonverbal immediacy cues that traditionally uh, Richmond kind of put them out into a list for uh, education. So things like, so the ones with the stars, by the way, are reversed, right? So these are things that are not immediate. So you'll see later in my research I reversed these. Uh, but you know, things like not, not standing behind the desk, but coming out and walking about among the students or uh, gesturing. I'm from New York City, so I gesture a lot. Uh, use monotone, dull voice when talking to the class. Bueller, 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 you know. Uh, looks at the class while talking, right? Rather than just look at the. Have you ever had an instructor that stands there looking at their lecture notes the entire time? It's, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of intuitive, right? You know it because you've experienced all these things in your life. Uh, it's a very tense body position uh, when talking to the class. So not doing that would be immediate, right? Because it's a reversed one. Touches students in class. And this was on the original one. Uh, but this was often pulled out in the higher ed and adult education. But with children, right, the idea of teaching, especially elementary school teachers, there's a, there's a lot of physical contact inappropriate ways, of course. Uh, but there is, you know, touching, right? If you ever seen two people flirting, right, there's a lot of hand touching and, and so on, right? So those sorts of things. Playing with their hair and so on. Uh, moves around the classroom, sits on desk or chair when not when teaching, rather than moving. Looks at the boards and notes, stands behind the podium, has a relaxed body position, right? You know, someone who's standing very strictly and very rigidly is kind of less inviting to you, isn't it? When someone's opening up, we've seen that with power poses and stuff. Um, so, smiles and uses a variety of expression. Again, that kind of idea of Bueller, Bueller. Uh, the verbal immediacy cues, um, I won't read through all of them because it's kind of boring to do that, but. Humor was an interesting one because it's been found to be very common in the classrooms that have a very strong correlation with immediacy. You'll see later in my research that there wasn't a strong correlation with that in online. I'll uh, use the students' names and, and you know, addresses me by name, right? So the student, the teacher, right? Please call me Anthony versus Dr. Saber or something like that, which would be more uh, distancing, right? Um, so praise the students' works and comments. is addressed by his or first name by students. So. These were the original ones that were constructed in 1988 by Gorham. So social presence, what is that then? Well, first of all, social presence has become popular online, uh, particularly by uh, the research of Gordana and Zittel. I'm still not sure how to say his name. Uh, back in 1997, and it was made more popular with um, research on the uh, community of inquiry model. Right? So, since that time. However, what happened was 
and this is my kind of rhetoric here, I guess, is that at the time of the community of inquiry model, they were really looking for, you know, pushing the agenda of constructivist learning, you know, constructivist social construction of learning, and so on. And the idea of constructionism, right, social constructionism in particular, is that you need to develop community, right? You need to have this social aspect of it. But well, what they did was they looked for a theoretical foundation to support it, so they turned to social presence. Because it sounds like it matches. But my research and my um, argument that I'm making, I'm presenting next month, at, or next week rather, at ACT, is that they misconstrued this. They basically took social presence, flipped it inside out, and called it something that's not. And what they actually do is they started calling social presence the same thing as immediacy. And so they confounded the two constructs at this time in the early 2000s. And so they even said, like, social presence scale was based on immediacy, right? They actually said it, right? Uh, Rourke and Garrison said, Rourke and Anderson and Garrison said that the, the, the construct of social presence can be traced back to Moravia's concept of immediacy, which is not true. It's, it's tracked back to... Uh, Short et al.'s research, where they actually define the top of the construct. Uh, Swan herself, who is very prominent in the, immediate, in the social presence field, said that social presence slash immediacy in online environments has accordingly concerned itself with the immediacy behaviors. Well, when I was looking at my research, I, I talked to, or I was looking to do my research for my dissertation, I was talking to Patrick Lowenthal, I think some of you know him, he did a talk yesterday. He's very big in social presence uh, research. And he started talking about social presence. He started saying, you know, what is it? And I was like, I don't know, what is it? And he started talking about a drill sergeant, right? A drill sergeant in your face, screaming at you, spittlehead in your face, that's a lot of social presence, <laughs> right? So but what happened was they started defining it because they wanted to define it as this idea of social constructivist learning communities and environments. They were really construing it as this, like, positive social uh, behaviors and things that develop community and so on. Well, you know, it's not really about being nice, the construct of social presence. If you look back to the now, are they allowed to reconstruct it? We can find that's a whole different discussion. But the original construct of social presence was not about any of these things. So what Short Al defined in their book was that, first of all, social presence is related to how the presence of others influences our behavior. And I was really able to understand this when I was working on my dissertations. I would go to my office, which is a cubicle pot of, you know, 70 cubes or something, on Saturdays and Sundays, and I was the only person there. And I don't know if any of you have written a dissertation or a thesis, but you can go a little crazy, especially if you're alone. And you're, if no one else is there, you might throw things. You might scream. You might even cry. <laughs> I won't say that I did any of those things, but, you know, I was there alone, so no one knows. But as soon as you introduce one person to that environment, so once in a while, like a janitor would come in, any person with custodians would come in, and I immediately changed my behavior. Like, immediately. I was just more restrained in my behaviors. The things that I'd scream or say out loud would change. So the idea is that just the presence of others changes how you behave. And this is not mysterious, is it? Right? A micromanaging manager versus a manager who's very transformative or something. You can see differences. So that's the first aspect of it. The second thing is that the nature of a task, right? What's your task? If your task is to say, for example, communicate the time that the movie will start to make to your spouse. The text message should suffice, I think, right? right? So each, any kind of specific tasks have different levels of human socio-emotional communication requirements. Now, what if you want to, well, I shouldn't go through them all here, because I have slides that follow up. So I'll, I'll go into more detail in a moment, but also, the perceptions of the level of socio-emotional cues required to achieve a task, and the effects of communication medium. So, these four aspects, and I'll explain them in more detail. As I mentioned earlier, again, people might think that this is more of a social presence, but they're not. This is just as much social presence. So, think about a police officer—you know, a police officer on the beat versus a peace officer. You can imagine they're both very different, but they should both have a high presence in the community, right? You'd expect them to be very different, maybe very militaristic even, in one community, where here they're very servant oriented. So, uh, and this is the idea of being alone in the office. You can't see it well there, but someone's hiding into their cube. So social, again, the presence of others, uh, also the nature of the task. So when I work for Korean companies, uh, Koreans are a very um, relational community, culture. So you know, human relationships are very important to them. Obviously, every culture is different, right? 
And so, for example, if they were going to have a high-level meeting, they would never do it across like Zoom or Skype or something. They would always fly to the other country and have those meetings in person. We do that too in the West, right? You have these large summit meetings. Can you imagine a summit meeting via Skype? It just doesn't seem right, right? So these high-level, very high-stakes kinds of meetings, we're going to be in person uh, to, in order to do it properly. Why? Because you need to be able to see the nuances of what people are saying, what they're doing. An example that I experienced where nuance can really be important is I was sitting in a meeting once in, in, for Hyundai Kian. I was the only non-Korean there, only English, native English speaker. And it was on the opposite side of the table, there was all these powerful professors and executive leaders of a, of a university and so on. And on my side of the table, it all lined up and matched across the table to those people. I was sitting at the end of the table. I was the lowest ranking person <laughs> as a manager. Uh, but you know, I was asked to take notes. So I had to listen to it all in Korean and think, no, so I, being a good note taker and very studious, I was sitting there listening very carefully and very anyway, that's in English, but just translating from Korean and writing them all down. And then uh, the next day I said, yeah, I submitted my, my meeting notes, and then I, but I, at one point I interpreted that one of the professors had said yes to providing some free services. And then my, my team leader, she said, he didn't say yes, he said no. I said, no, he very clearly said, okay. I will do that. She said, but you have to look at the nuance. I was like, what do you mean? She said, he was like leaning back and he was shaking his head like this and he was looking at the other guys. They were looking at him and he said, okay, sure. Right? Okay, sure is very different than okay, sure. Right? So not only the body language, not only the verbal, but the, bo the body language and the social communication through eyes and so on was very important. So that's why sometimes these high level meetings require being in person because to achieve that task of negotiation in that case, you need to be able to see the nuanced communication that's especially through nonverbal. So we imagine that certain tasks require this high level of socio-emotional communication. Now also some tasks are perceived to require that. Uh, so if you ask for if you were to ask a very traditional approach, I asked for someone's hand in marriage, would you just text the father? Yo, homie, can I marry your daughter? I mean, you wouldn't do it. I would perceive that there's an appropriate way to do it. Or, you know, the appropriate way to propose to someone traditionally. Right? Get like down on me in a romantic setting or some very memorable thing versus, like, texting, right? Can you imagine texting? Like, will you marry me? I mean, I guess it happens somewhat today. But you probably don't tell all your friends, he texted me, he wants to marry me. Right? You don't normally do that. So we perceive that certain things require that level, even if they don't necessarily require we perceive that to be part of that. Um, so when you think to like teaching, right? If a student is complaining that another student harasses them, what's the <coughs> best approach to communicating with a student? Would you say, would email be the best approach? Might be okay, but you probably want to at least pick up the phone and talk to the student on the phone, maybe a video chat, maybe invite them to your office. Because now we're looking at a higher level of negotiation or, or interaction required, uh, dealing with things like that. So. Uh, and finally, the other idea of social presence is that the effect of the medium itself. So, talking on the phone, that medium doesn't provide you the option of seeing visual cues and so on. So the medium itself can control what, type, what types of social cues you can uh, communicate with someone else. So obviously, video conferencing offers a higher level of visuals, uh, you know, socio-emotional cues, whether that's a verbal. And so if you're still missing something, you're missing the tactile, you know, some of the, the ability to smell and so on. Um, so face-to-face -face would be the highest. And even face-to-face -face has a difference, right? We talked about proximity before. Being closer to someone offers more, sometimes too much, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> so you ever have someone, who's, like, it's like a Seinfeld episode, right? Someone who's a close talker, right? Like, too close, or something, or a low talker or something. So we have all these different things. So the medium can also be the space between us, physically, even in person. So the idea of, of a lectern between you and the other person, you're putting a, something between you, right? And it's a, it's a, just a lectern. So those are the four aspects, again, of social presence. The idea that uh, just the presence of others can affect your behavior, um, that some tasks require higher levels of socio-emotional communication cues. The third one is that some are just perceived to require that, even if they don't, maybe. Uh, and the last one is that the medium that you're communicating through affects the social communication. So that's what, immediate, that's what social presence is. 
Notice I didn't say anything about like or dislike. So the concept, the difference between the two to sum it up is that social presence really is about that, those four factors, whereas immediacy is about like giving cues of like and dislike so that I'm telling you you can or not approach me. So we can perceive certain things like if I send you a text message, like, yeah, sure, you know, how can I help you versus picking up the phone and calling you? You're also sending a message, hey, I'm more willing to help you. I'm more willing to engage with you. I'm more willing to communicate with you. Right? If you were to show up to the student's door and knock on their door, and say, hey, how can I help you? You might, over, you might be over-signaling, right? It might be too much. So there's also the potential for too much immediacy, right? Too much immediacy, uh, which can also push people away. So let me talk about my study then. So my study did, it looked at uh, online courses at Boise State University. And I restricted it to fully online program courses. So not one-off courses on campus for campus based students, but fully online programs. And then among fully online programs, we have two types. Those that are self-supported and those that are um, part of the uh, uh, regular budget model, so non-self-supported programs. So at Boise State, these are all self-supported. So I didn't include these. Although the ed tech program has moved to self-supported, uh, not self-supported. Um, these are all part of the appropriated budget model. So it left me with a pool of 844 students at that time. I ended up sending out my survey to all of those 844, got 177 responses, 144 are able to use. Uh, the reason I, I, had, I used non-self-supported programs is because they all use the same LMS, they've all been developed by eCampus Center at Boise State using the same design model and process. Uh, they all you know, use a standardized structure that they're programming for them, which is pretty similar across programs. And they all receive support as they launch their course and revise their courses through ECAP. So, so I tried to minimize the variables, right? So the results were that, uh, you know, most, first of all, they were mostly female, which is not surprising, right, in higher ed today and online. Uh, also, Boise State's programs tend to be more the traditional female uh, fields, right, like nursing or education or uh, social work and so on, not too many STEM type of fields. So primarily female the response. Location was, you know, half of them came from outside of the Boise region, this Northwest region. Uh, so it was a pretty good diversity of people from across the country. Uh, and also um, how many semesters they had been in their program. So, you know, most of them have been at least two semesters. A lot of them also been, you know, four semesters in and so on. So we can say, that, you know, almost half of them are kind of seasoned you know, online learners, right? Not brand new learners. The average age is 36, um, with a pretty large range of students. I think like all of them are, that are in my class, for introduction online learning are right here in this area. Okay, so last year people asked me about the survey that I constructed. I, I constructed a survey where I took those two, the, the Gorham, the verbal and nonverbal immediacy constructs. And back in 2004, another student for his dissertation had brought those together, his name is McAllister, he brought them together and modified the items a bit to be more relevant to online. But the problem was in 2004, online was only text-based. There were no Zoom options, professors weren't talking to students on the phone, there were no smartphones. So it wasn't really relevant to today, so what I did was then I modified those more so they're more relevant to today. So they're based on the same uh, items, but they're somewhat modified. So I did the factor analysis on them, and of the 31 items, three of them were eventually dropped because of multicollinearity and other issues. Um, but once I finished that, they had pretty strong internal reliability. Uh, the Chromeback Alphas you know, came out quite strong, and they were very similar to prior studies uh, in, the, in the extent research on uh, these scales. And they were very similar to McAllister. McAllister came up with a 0.92 for his, and so quite similar. So, I was pretty happy with the way they all came out. And they loaded actually a two factor analysis also uh, worked, but a single factor was more appropriate because they've been typically used on a similar on one scale. So, uh, but it was interesting that many of the factors for nonverbal immediacy loaded together, many of the factors for verbal loaded together, um, but some of them crossed over. Anyway, so research question one, the results. Um, we found that the just that you know the the, media, uh, the mean for verbal immediacy, nonverbal immediacy, and total immediacy, which is these two combined, nonverbal immediacy had a higher average. 
And this is how much the instructors are just, the students are reporting the instructors to be using ABC behaviors. So, you know, not, not so high, not so high, somewhat low, right? This is on a four scale, right? Zero to four scale. So, not so high, like kind of, if you're in a grade, then you say maybe kind of a C. Right? Instructors are getting a C for student perceptions of their ABC behaviors. So, a lot of room for improvement, right? So, the idea is what are immediate instructors doing then? and what are non-immediate instructors doing, and how can we help instructors start to use more immediate behaviors? As instructional designers, what can we do to design immediacy into the courses as well? Those are some of the questions that have been, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, so here it is broken down by the items for verbal. So we can see that students reported that these are the highest use by faculty, so provided feedback on work. Faculty provided feedback, that was the most immediate thing they did. That's good, I think, right? They should be doing that. Uh, but some things that they didn't do very well was like talking about things outside the course. You know? So for, if you're a graduate student, you pretty much expect to be able to talk about things outside the course with your faculty, right? Mentoring and even just small talk. Often students might come up at the end of the course or at the beginning of the class and talk to you in the classroom maybe. Uh, using personal examples, making it very personal. Not being used so much or humor was used very little. Um, so yeah, so some of the things that they did a lot was, use, they did use their students' names a lot. For, for Americans, that's good. I don't know if Koreans would like that so much, but for Americans, it's good. Uh, praise their work. They did that more frequently. And ask questions. So, you know, asking questions, but still, it's not very high, right? You'd think it could be higher. Asking them to make phone calls. How many of you are online teachers? Yeah, so do you have your students call you a lot? Yeah? I've given out my cell phone number to my students in the, in the syllabus and in the course via email. Said, so please feel free to text me, for example. In the last three years, two students have texted me. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, to be honest. Meanwhile, they're texting everyone else, right? It's not chatting, whatever, not TikTok and so on. Uh, for the nonverbal, uh, so here we can see that we do have higher means again. This, again, this is R means reversed, so it's actually the inverse of tense communication, not using tense communication was you know, the, the highest rated thing, and paying attention to students was important to them, and the, they, were, they felt that the faculty were paying attention to them. Pretty good. Uh, but things that they weren't doing were like a variety of communication, which we'll see later when I look at the channels of communication that the faculty used. We can see why this is kind of low here. Variety of tones. And so again, this is the style of writing, right? Now, the way I, one of the things that I've done to be more immediate with my students is you know, every, about two weeks into a seven-week course, and again, around five weeks, I sent each student an individualized email. 20 students, pretty easy to do. Uh, each of them an individualized email, letting them know where they are in the course, or use their name, you know, use things like, how can we help you do this, and so on. So that kind of very, uh, that kind of tone that I use in my, in my language, the tone that I'm insinuating that we are together working on their plan for them doing better, uh, I reach out to them in a variety of different channels, sometimes I send out, uh, Google Hangouts, message to them, sometimes they send out uh, email and so on. So we can see that you know this idea of friendliness, which is interesting. You know, I live in Boise, which is considered to be quite friendly, but the fact that they aren't being so friendly in their classes, so interesting to think of. So um, research question two, I started looking at the correlations between the idea of affective learning, which most of the research in classroom based has found very strong correlations between student perceptions of instructor immediacy and student perceptions of their own affective learning, right? The, the values of the field and, and, and those kind of soft ideas and, and so on, versus perceived learning and cogn of cognitive learning, right? So they've typically measured perceived learning because, I don't know if you've done research on that before, but it's pretty hard to measure consistently a, a more objective values of, of, of learning, of cognitive learning. Anyway, the research has always found that affective has much stronger correlations. Which is not surprising because we're also talking about an affective concept, immediacy, right? Feelings of like and dislike. So anyway, but it does have a pretty you know, moderate correlation with perceived perceptions of, of perceptions of learning, and pretty you know stronger uh, correlation with course satisfaction. Interesting thing we find is again the nonverbal has a stronger relationship than the verbal on affective learning, but the perceived has a the verbal has a bit stronger on the perceived learning, which is interesting. The cognitive learning. But again, the nonverbal is stronger on course satisfaction. So overall, nonverbal has a stronger relationship with it 
Uh, which is interesting, right? Because it's not so much as much as what you say as what you do, right? And what you communicate and what you're doing to students. So if you say you're going to get your feedback to them within three days and you take five days, students hold you accountable for that. They remember that. They don't forget it. They know. Um, so what I, I also looked at um, breaking it down by verbal communications. What were the strongest correlations? I found that uh, asking questions to students had the strongest correlations as well as providing feedback on their work. So the idea that you can you know, just give them a grade and move on is probably not going to be perceived as very immediate by your students. You know, by the way, immediate isn't necessarily about fast, but it does have some relationship with fast, which we'll get to in a moment. I also did with nonverbal and the idea of, um, again, a reversed correlated here, but seem distant personally. So if they seem close to you, they feel, they sense that you're close. And really this is the idea of perceptual close or emotional closeness, but also this idea that, you know, if you ever talk to someone on your phone, it just feels like they're in the same room as you almost, right? It just feels close. Um, and you've also been very close to someone, maybe lying in the same bed and they feel very distant, right? So that idea of emotional closeness. And the idea that they feel or perceive that they, they're being paid attention to you. And how that's been relayed through nonverbal uh, messages. So I did a split analysis. I split the sample in half. Those that are above the mean, which are here on the left, and those that are below the mean. And we saw a little bit of difference there, right? V2, which is asking questions or encouraging students to respond. Higher immediate instructors, we're using that more. That was one of the major differences, right? We can see some other smaller differences, but this one, you know, moved three places in the rankings. So to me, I think that's something that you can start with a pointer, right? You can start saying to your teachers, hey, ask your students some questions and encourage them to respond to you. Send out an email and say, how are you guys feeling about the course so far? Ask them questions, engage them out. Uh, seeing this in personally was the one that had the biggest change on the nonverbal. So again, really working to, to build that sense of that you're there for them, that you're in the same place for them. That kind of behavior will be very helpful. Um, let's see. So this one I found really interesting. So I, you know, because the term immediacy sounds like speed, I looked at the idea of speed in the course. How quickly did the instructor respond to questions and how quickly did the instructor give feedback? So this is the idea of being supportive in the kind of on the fly. You know, like if, if something is due Saturday night, when do you get questions? Saturday night, right? That's when you're like, God, I should never make anything due on Saturday night ever anymore, right? Uh, so there was, you know, students reported that the, uh, there was a, you know, a mean of 2.66. That's about how fast did your instructor report to you, respond to you on these things? So we found that instructors are more supportive and give feedback or you know, responses more quickly to students perceive when they have a quick question, but the feedback coming to them on assignments and so on is slower. Um, and also with the relationships. So with verbal immediacy, we can see uh, you know, to these re reply speed, there's some relationship, a pretty strong relationship with nonverbal immediacy. Again, you know, if a student asks a question to you, even just responding, hey, I'm, you know, I'm out of the office right now. Can I talk to you tomorrow about this? Or can I send you an email later about this? Might be helpful because you're now implying that you're responding to them. You're letting them know uh, that, that you're there for them and that you want to help them and that you'll support them. So those kind of behaviors. Uh, and also with the feedback, you can see again that nonverbal had a little bit higher of a relationship. So I looked at the, uh, re the use of communication channels and I listed out 12 on the survey. You can see two of them didn't have any responses. So none of the faculty reported using any social media to communicate with their students, and none of the students reported the faculty using mobile texting apps with their students. Which I thought, you know, in and of itself was interesting, right? Um, so why aren't students using those? That's a whole other research study that I think could be quite interesting. We can see that primarily they reported email, not surprising, announcements within the LMS, uh, forums, and feedback on assignments, like written feedback typically on assignment were the most primarily, you know, not surprising, right, traditional approaches. But we also saw that, you know, some of the instructors were using videos and telephone. You know, videos typically uh, being the idea of a pre-made video of the course. Uh, video conferencing with students, which was quite, you know, surprisingly high, I thought. Uh, and then in-person meetings, SMS, and so on. So the um, number of communication channels used by faculty was around four. The faculty used about four different types of communication channels uh, students are saying. Okay, and, you know, 
probably these four, right, for most of them. Uh, and so we found that there was a quite strong relationship with the number of channels used with uh, nonverbal immediacy especially. Again, the idea of they're, commu they're communicating with me on a variety of different channels. Uh, I also compared uh, how, again, I split them into high and low instructors, high immediacy and low immediacy instructors, <clears throat> and looked at the differences. And we can see that there was quite a difference here, especially on announcements. So immediate, higher immediacy instructors are using announcements more, significantly more, than uh, non lower immediacy instructors. We can also see here the idea of video conferences, too, had quite a big difference. So there's two things you can start saying to your faculty if they you know, want to improve their immediacy or their perceptions of their instructor, of their teaching. Uh, we can say, well, start holding a video conference. I do in my courses. I hold maybe three happy hour types of meetings a semester. Not required to come. Uh, I've also reached out. I had a student. It was a really crazy experience for him. He had posted a very inappropriate picture by accident because he thought he was searching his hard drive. He was actually searching the internet when he was trying to embed an image into Google Sites. And it shows a little thumbnail. It looked like his hard drive, but it was actually a hard drive coming from the internet that had very, very, very inappropriate search terms on there. Uh, female students in the course reached out to me by email. And when I looked, I was shocked. I was like, okay, what's going on? This, clearly, he's not stupid enough to post this because he could get arrested for this. Um, so I reached out to him, and he, you know, I said, give me a call, and we talked on the phone, and we were able to solve the problem at 11 p.m. on a Friday night. We were able to solve the problem. Uh, and that really helped me help him, but I'm quite sure he felt that I was being quite immediate with him. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, out of a very strong need. And I also reached out to the students and communicated with them regularly about it as well. Um, so, you know, I think that we can start looking at, all right, what are high instructor, high immediacy instructors doing, and how can we start replicating that that success with other instructors. Um, <clears throat> so again, the, the, co the correlations are you know, moderate, low to moderate, but they're there. And I found that announcements had the highest correlation, which I thought was so interesting. It's so simple. Faculty can just use announcements in their courses. Now, what if they add a video announcement to their course? Now you're taking it to the next level, right? So what if they now make a video announcement where they're informal, they're casual, and talking to their students as if they're people rather than a distance student, right? In this course, you'll be learning about, for instead of, you know, hey, in this course we're going to be talking about this, and we're going to be learning about that. So using a very informal style can be helpful, right? So you just start compounding these approaches. What if in that announcement you say, in that video announcement you say to your students in an informal, casual way, mention some of their names even, and you say, hey, if any of you have any questions, feel free to call me, here's my number. Right? So now you can start compounding the levels of immediacy that you're using. <clears throat> okay, as part of this, I also did a. Uh, let's check the time here. I also did a um, uh, qualitative research. So I, I looked at um, the nine different students. Uh, they were all women except for one man, just by chance. I tried to get more men, but wasn't able to. Um, this is who they were, right? So she was the most, you know, she ranked her instructors as very immediate and. Laura ranked them as very low, and so it was very interesting to talk with them and, and find out more about their experience. So as a result of it, I came up with five themes. I collected their interviews, made trans, you know, transcribed them, did the text analysis, and also used their survey uh, open uh, responses as well. And I came up with five, five themes that they felt that uh, immediate instructors were doing. And it was commitment to the role. They just felt that their professors were really committed to it, right? They really cared about teaching and so on. And that they were there for their students. And I summed up my dissertation by saying, you know, rather than being a guide on the side, you know, your instructor should be, you know, a guide at my side, right? They want to feel that you're at their side for them, not just on the side. You know, think about a tour guide, right? They can just be like, oh, go over there, go over there. They're a guide on the side, right? Go over there. Versus one that's like, hey, come on, come with me. Let's go. I'll show you this, I'll show you that. So very different perception. Uh, they're very accessible and responsive to students. Again, that's very strongly related with the whole construct itself. Extenuous and continuous guidance and feedback. And so this was something I found the students were saying. Was the faculty were giving them a lot of feedback on their assignments. They were giving them quick feedback. It was three days. Because the students expected feedback in a seven-week course anyway. They expected feedback on assignments within three days. That's one of the things that I've been doing now in my teaching. And it's been really helpful for me because I feel so much less stressed. Right? Did you ever have those assignments that you push off for a week? 
10 days and like, God, I, I get this feedback with students. And I get done right away because I know it's going to benefit them, but it's benefiting me. But I'm not having that in the back of my mind for 10 days that, that i got to do that. Uh, also, this idea of being very encouraging and reassuring, right? Hey, you can do it. You can do it. And so on. So, by kind of, you know, triangulating all this quantitative and qualitative data, I was able to come up with seven key findings about immediacy in online courses, at least fully online program courses anyway. Uh, number one is the idea of continuous engagement or the feedback cycle, I call it. So the first stage really happens prior to the course. And this is where any of you who are instructional designers, or if you're a faculty designing your own course, this is where you start already being immediate with your students. You know, what do you say in your syllabus? Right? What are you doing, uh, you know, what are you doing to invite approach in your syllabus? Are you using an a very inform, a very formal distance? communication in your syllabus. How about the video that you add to your course announcement before the course even starts? Right? What, or videos that you might have throughout your course. Or just what you say about your communication plan. You know, I have one faculty who's like, don't even try calling me after the hour of 5 o'clock. Right? Don't even try email. Don't even email me. And she just gives like two hours on Tuesday and two hours on Thursday and she will check her email. Like, you're definitely not <laughs> going to be very immediate with your, your students, right? Off the board. You know, it's like, do you ever do interviews with someone and you can tell within like a minute, right, whether or not this person's going to fit or not, right? But you kind of make those judgments really quickly. So, the self introduction board, what do you do there? Uh, again, the, the support continues into the course, but students are working on their assignments, right? Are you getting back to them within 24 hours? Students want responses within 24 hours to their emails. That's what they were saying in my study. Within 24 hours. Well, a lot of faculty say 48 hours, from what I've seen. Within 48 hours, I'll get back to you. The students are asking for 24 hours. Me personally, I use about two to six hours in my age. And obviously not overnight, you know, super, but two to six hours after. Um, it's not that hard these days. Smartphones, right? Like it all comes through their phone anyway. Um, providing a lot of formative feedback, and that's just good instructional design, right? Providing opportunities for students to draft out assignments. You give them feedback, and then they have a chance to resubmit it. In fact. Uh, an article I was reading just the other day says, don't even give some of the feedback. The final paper, it's too late for them to make any corrections on it anyway. Maybe in the next course, good luck, here's the corrections in your next course. But a lot of students were never going to take another English writing course. They took that one they needed for their foundation course, and they're done. What's the point of giving them all that feedback at the end? Give them the feedback throughout the middle, throughout the stages and cycles. So um, being flexible and accommodating. You know, the idea that this, this hard-nosed instructor is Deadlines are deadlines. 12 p.m. midnight, or 12 midnight on Tuesday night, that's it. 12 01, too late, you're done. No, that's not real life. Especially in online where we have so many non-traditional students who are juggling careers and children and, and everything else. In fact, the course I just finished up teaching, we have a one group assignment in week five of the course. Now you always have that one group, right? That has the problems. And this one group, one girl was on a business trip to Texas. One girl was just not very active in the course. Two of the other students had dropped the course. And the one guy in the course, oh, he got cancer and had a surgery last uh, that week. He still finished the course and did great. But like, it took a lot of communication between me and the three, and the four, the three of them to be able to, to, you know, I gave them flexible deadlines and was accommodating of their situation. Uh, so individualized notifications, again, I do, personally, I send out, like I said, week two, week five, I send out an email to each student and tell them where they're standing in the course and suggest students with, that are having trouble plan to move forward. Uh, and things like summarizing and discussion boards and so on. Uh, stage three is that individualized feedback. This is when you're getting, you know, kind of at the end, right? Using first names and focusing on strengths, using of cushioning. You know, that whole sandwich approach, as cheesy and as used as it is, it still works. People like it. Uh, discussing feedback. So the idea of engaging students in a, in a discussion about their assignments, not just giving them the feedback and you're done. The idea of discuss, you know, encourage, engaging with them. Challenging them to a deeper thinking also is very important. Finding to adaptive communication. Again, this is the idea that highly media instructors are using a range of communications, like I expressed before. You know, you might start off with an email, but then if it really seems like there's a problem, like group interaction problems, you might need to raise that to a video conference, right? Because of that task. The task is 
really large human-to-human -human interaction problems. You have to raise that social presence and you have to raise that immediacy level. The third one is the use of instructor videos. I found that interesting because instructor videos, as much as I've been talking about them, aren't that important. They're nice to have, but they're not super important, which is nice to know because they're very time intensive. But that leads to the next concept, this idea of the threshold of immediacy, which is my next slide. I found in the research, and this is backed up by the literature also, there's a threshold effect. In other words, you should be immediate, but if you get to a certain amount, you've done enough. Right? You don't have to keep you know, sending out an email every week with an individualized tracking of their, of, their, of, their, of their learning. You don't need to make a video every single module. But if you have enough things that you're doing that you're being immediate, that maybe you don't even need the video competition because the students know you're there for them. They've seen you, they've heard your voice, they've, they've heard your voice in your introductions and so on. So once you get to that threshold point, you're good. So you don't have to go totally crazy to be immediate in your faculty and students. And think about it this way. Do you want to be a clingy teacher? <laughs> Do you want to annoy, right? Like think of the idea of a clingy boyfriend or girlfriend that's constantly wanting to be with you and supporting you too much. Like, get away, all right, I get the point, you love me, you care about me, now move on. <laughs> Want to watch TV or whatever? Okay. I'm not verbalizing anything personally. <laughs> uh, positive tone, right? I mean, it's not, it's not surprising, is it, right? Using a positive tone, but again, especially in the verbal, text based verbal, right? The way you're toning your messages to people uh, has a very strong correlation, and students talk about that a lot in their, um, their, their uh, descriptions, right? He was so friendly, he was kind, she was positive all the time, and so on. Another idea is this idea of middleness, and this is really based on the idea of responsiveness versus assertiveness. So, you know, you get a lot of these faculty that might be kind of wishy-washy, right? They're so nice to their students. They're so, okay, yeah, anytime you want. I see that as instructional designers sometimes. Their faculty are like, oh yeah, whenever you're ready, just send them to me. I'm like, no, give them a deadline, right? They need a deadline, right? Um, so this idea of assertiveness, but also responsiveness, balanced, right? You don't want to push them too hard and like, be like so accountability focused that they're like struggling to even survive your course. But at the same time, you don't want to be so wishy-washy and so supportive that they, they don't feel challenged. So really highly immediate instructors were able to balance this very well. Uh, and finally, the last one was humor. And this, I listed this one because it was really a surprising finding because there's so many studies that talk about humor in the classroom. And when I talk with students about this really they were very aware of it as well. They were very aware that in an online setting, it's, it's a little dangerous to try to use humor because you can't see the reaction of people. You can't see, maybe, maybe that student, you don't know that they have no legs. And you might say something, trying to be humorous, and you've just insulted that entire class of people or something. So you know, trying to be um, funny wasn't very uh, commonly used in online. Some students, kind of interpreted the idea of humor also very differently. Some thought of it as a traditional idea of joking, whereas other people thought of it as like this idea of being, having humility, and others thought about kind of being personable. So, you know, the humor research has, it's a really difficult topic, humor, because it has so many different, you know, variations of what that is. So anyway, future research. I think that uh, the next thing I want to do is really refine this immediacy scale and put it out there so that other people can use it. Uh, what a great way to incorporate that into your teaching, uh, uh, teaching evaluations and so on. But the idea of timeliness of response, that's not there in face-to-face. -face. Why? Because we're face-to-face. -face. Right? In the classroom, did he answer my question? Well, he stood there, you know, like, you know, we do have response time, right? So if you ask someone a question, they take, like, more than, like, two or three seconds, you think it's weird, right? But in online, it's really important. That's that response time. So I think we need to add some questions about the timeliness of response. And also the types of communication technologies used. You know, how did you communicate with your student? Which of these technologies did <laughs> you use? Uh, and also the idea of assertiveness, right? Now, because a lot of the immediacy scales, the immediacy scales, they're using more responsiveness types of questions. But this idea of assertiveness also needs to be on there as well. So, you know, are they about to see if there's a balance there among those two items? So this is the uh, you know what I think the future research agenda should be. And so, yeah, thank you so much for listening to my. You know, being a, a four a forty nine minute lecture is not very immediate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about how much time do we have left? Comments? Did you ask some questions? Yeah. Would you look at all or any 
any of the courses that you've seen used um, audio photos a lot, like SoundCloud or podcasting? And you know, is that I've, like comparable to video? Yeah, I've designed myself about eight, four, 50 courses, and I've seen you know hundreds of others. Very few people are using audio. Mm -hmm. In the courses that I've seen at Boise State for online program. I mean, they're using like videos, some people are using podcasts, but the faculty themselves making audio only files, not so common at our institution, but I think um, more likely they'll just make a video, which would be, high, which would be more immediate, uh, at least according to the theory. Um, teach a developmental English class, and I'll record audio of me reading a lot of the readings so that students can get them in other ways. It's when they use audio, mm -hmm. or if they kind of struggle with reading comprehension, they can hear somebody read the cadence of the sentences while they're tracking things. Are, are students like audio a lot because they, um, they, particularly the students in our school of dentistry, they'll put them on 1.25 or 1.5 and listen to their instructor lectures mm -hmm. like during their commute, yeah. mm -hmm. and they really like so you should speak really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, I got good feedback from when I started incorporating the audio. The students responded well to it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a higher level of ease. Right? You're now offering them more cues to who you are. Through your voice, through the timbre of your voice, the tone of your voice, the speed of your voice, I guess. It might be odd, right? They, 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 well, you sound different in person. Yes, because you're always listening to 1.5 speed. <laughs> yeah. So at the University of Oregon, we have classes that can be up to 500 people. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the immediacy behaviors that are personalized. Online courses. Online courses. Mm -hmm. um, that are personalized, that are direct, that are within two to four hours, you know, response time, as, as you were saying. And I'm thinking of how you scale up um, a class community. Like the one that you're describing is like 20 people. Yeah. Um, but when you have multiple, uh, like, I don't, I don't, can't do math. How many times is 20 to 500? So I think a lot of that is a question that you have to ask at the design stage, right? Mm -hmm. So does everything? Do you need to use a high level of immediacy for everything? Right? Does every course need to have a high level of immediacy? That's a good question to ask. Because lower levels of immediacy might be sufficient. Right? It's like the question I was asking in the media um, meeting before. Do you need to have AAA highest quality video or multimedia? Sometimes it's good. But sometimes you just need something quick and simple. Uh, some courses maybe don't require so much immediacy. For example, I personally think that our 100 level courses should be like 20 students, not 300 and 400 students. Why? Because those are brand new students. You might get better retention if you can give those students a higher level of immediacy. You can inculcate them into the values of your field, more likely in that case. And then once students get to the higher division courses, they've already bought into being a biologist. They've already bought into the idea of a business major. They already understand the values of the field. They've already gotten there, especially if you've built that up in the beginning. So in my opinion, we should be you know, having these small, meaning small level courses for those you know what <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the current example, I would imagine there's TAs assisting in this project. Maybe. Um, okay. <laughs> no, I was talking so, about the 500 person course. So oh, just being is it easy to see? Is uh, it as effective if it's yeah. TAs and an instructor? I think so. And so, here, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is the flip grid. And so, that was a high, uh, relatively high enrollment course, had about 90 students in it. Um, and so, that course is structured with one faculty. And two, um, they're calling them coaches. Mm -hmm. They're basically low-paid TAs, in my opinion. It's kind of a scam. It's not good for them. Uh, but they're doing it because they love it. They love teaching. Like one's a lawyer, and the other one's like a retired professor. So, you know, they know what they're signing up for, and they're happy with it. And that course, they have the instructors using Flipgrid. And so, the instructor is doing all the interaction with the students week to week on the Flipgrid, high immediacy type of communication. And she's also the one grading the final assignment that they submit, the summative evaluation. But throughout the course, those instruct the, the, the coaches are the ones providing the less immediate, or well, not necessarily less immediate, but um, lower immediacy feedback on their assignments, the formative feedback, which also can be very important for immediacy. So now, training them to be more immediate, right, in the words that they use, or maybe using voice uh, feedback, Blackboard can do it, right? The canvas can do it as well. Um, so training them to do that, I think, can help 
So it really depends on these matters of efficiency versus outcomes, right? And what are your outcomes that you're trying to reach and you know, what's your efficiency model going to be? Yeah, I don't, I don't think departments are that transparent usually, though, in the promises they're making to students mm -hmm. about what students will, will get out of their experience in a 500 person class. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd love to see if there was a university that had guidance to administrations. Mm -hmm. Around like here's here's ideal course size based on this research. Mm -hmm. Here's why you invest in more TAs. Here's why you invest in smaller introductory mm -hmm. courses. I don't know if there are universities like represented in this room that are doing that, but especially for big state schools, it's it's like it's, it's a challenge. So a lot, like I said, a lot of this research on immediacy originated in large lecture halls, mm -hmm. 300, 400 right. students. Right. And so the whole idea was, how do we? First of all, it's important to be immediate, even in this large environment. How do you do it in a large environment? So some of the things that they found in those classes was the faculty member who walks up and down the aisles of the school, right? comes up the lecture hall while they're giving their speech. And technology helps with doing that more, because you can wear a mic and so on. Or smiling at the students, that coming out from behind the podium, uh, you know, using students' names. I mean, finding the students hard, but maybe you can memorize the names of the students in the first three rows, right? Uh, yeah? When you did your research, did you look at how some of this Behavior might be valuable between peers. And I'm imagining to student you, to student you facilitate that in a larger classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a research interest of mine, the idea of student to student immediacy. So, social presence, current literature, has been looking at social presence really as the idea of immediacy among students. Mm -hmm. like the idea of developing community among, among the students, calling it social presence, but it's not. But the idea of developing community among students. Encourage students to work together, construct knowledge together, maybe send them out, you know, include an article in a group activity on how to be more effective as a group, you know, not blaming each other, using polite communication. That's all actually immediacy, right? Like you're saying. Um, so social presence again, so that's that, that's why I think social presence is such a fascinating idea, and we're not using it because we've confounded it with immediacy and this idea of community development, but the idea of if you're going to have students do a group project, you really should encourage them to meet in a live synchronous meeting if they can. Because that might be more effective in negotiating the norms of the group and so on. So as a technologist who supports faculty to teach face-to-face, -face, um, but support faculty online in development, I sit here and I wonder what the faculty in the room think about um, the expectation of the UC and the amount of time it would take them, especially as they scale up in their own responsibilities to have not one class of 20, but say four classes of 20 each term. And maybe that's where the 500 question is coming from. Like, I I want to take your ideas back to my faculty, but I already feel the rocks being held at me, right? So yeah. Like, okay, can give us more time or more support. So let's really start off with the idea of expectations. Right? What's the expectation? What? How much needs can you use in the course of 500 students. First of all, you can say, let's look at why we're giving the course of 500 students. Is this appropriate or not? It's a whole different discussion, but if you're stuck with 500 students in your class, then what can I do? Okay, you're not going to send an individualized email to every 500 students, right? But what you could do is encourage students to review their own and send you a question if they have a question, right? So you say, okay, this week I want to add a quiz, right? Have you completed all your assignments? If you have, if you haven't, email me and let me know what problems you're having. Sense. So that's a way you can offer that idea that I'm encouraging you to engage with me, but I don't have the chance and the opportunity to engage with all of you. So now you're you're putting the onus on the students, but they know. So like when I said, I said that email you know, every student in my course, like 26, pretty easy to do. Usually only about four or five of them respond to me. They're just happy to know that I'm actually offering the option. Well, I think I'd want to be realistic with my faculty when I bring this to them that this isn't a toolkit of opportunities, but that their toolkit's probably going to look different because they don't have a lot of the flexibility necessary to go one to one. So that was the interesting thing when I said that video is not necessary to be doing all the other things, but that if you can't do all those other things, then video might be the great the best solution for you, right? Mm -hmm. You can't email every student, you just don't have the time. You can't get feedback to 500 students in three days. But what you can do is provide an email. You can send them an e uh, a message in some form, maybe by video. Uh, you can send them a video that says, you know, I'm looking through your assignments. These are some of the things I've seen that people have been doing well so far on day three, right? This is some of the things I think people have mistakes with. You'll get your feedback by the end of next week, but here's some ideas for you to think about right now while you're working on your next assignment. So now you're giving them a chance to get feedback more generic, but they might connect with some of those ideas and be able to incorporate that in their next assignment. So 
That idea of, you know, I guess the idea is not that you can't do immediacy, but how do you adapt it? And what different types of immediacy skills do you use? Send an email or announcement out to 500 students, but use that, you know, use read, and 